Open your Bibles to Matthew um, chapter 22. And the first verse of Matthew chapter 22. And the Bible says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. Now Jesus, we know his first miracle was done at a wedding. And now he's talking about a wedding in one of his parables, a very important parable. A lot of good things to learn from it. What does that tell me about Jesus? Well, it tells me he liked marriages. He invented marriage. He created the first one. He created Adam. And then God said, it's not good that man be alone. And then he created Eve. And then the Bible says in the book of Genesis, God brought the woman to the man. He brought the two together. And why did God do that? Well, a lot of reasons. Marriage is supposed to symbolize, falls far short a lot of times, but it's supposed to symbolize uh, that, that relationship between a man and a woman, that loving re relationship, that unity is supposed to symbolize the relationship between a believer and God. That's what it's supposed to symbolize. And of course, it has practical purposes to it. Man shouldn't be alone. It's good to have someone around to help look after you. That's a good thing. It's also good to make children. That's one of the reasons God said, multiply and replenish the earth. One of the great blessings of a marriage, and maybe the greatest blessing, is the, chi is the children. A child uh, that comes from the woman having been joined with the man. And the child is a gift from God. A little baby, so helpless and so needing of tender care and love and teaching and raising and uh, symbolizes the fact that we become children of God through Jesus. God loves children. Jesus said, Permit the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And so out of marriage comes children, a gift from God. And you know, you might, your marriage may have fallen apart. But if you had children, you still got the children. You, got, you still got the children as a result of that marriage, which shows the goodness of it. How marriage endures. It, it endures through the children. And of course, some people don't have children in this life. That's just the way it is for some. But they can have spiritual children, which is just as important. If you lead someone to Christ... They become your children from a spiritual standpoint. You teach them about the Lord, about the Bible. That's a great and wonderful thing. Paul didn't, wasn't married. He had no children. And yet he often called the people to whom he was writing his children because he was like a father, spiritually speaking to them. So the father-child situation or mother-child is uh, spiritual in nature. It's a relationship, a very important relationship that God created. He created it. Uh, he has two commands about marriage in the Ten Commandments. One has to do with faithfulness in marriage. Of course, that symbolizes the fact that we should be faithful to God. He only should be our God, the one we serve, follow, are submitted to, and want to please. And... Uh, and of course, then the great commandment to children, honor your mother and your father. So God created the family, which he knew children would come from. And then he put the responsibility on the children to make it work good. He said he didn't say, tell anything to the parents. He didn't tell the parents in the Ten Commandments. He does other elsewhere. But in the Ten Commandments, he didn't tell the parents to spank the children. He didn't tell the parents to correct the children. He didn't tell the parents to teach the children. He told the children to honor the parents. And that's where it really happens. Because if a child has a disobedient spirit, I don't care how good the parents are, going to go the wrong way. That was part of the parable of the prodigal son. The, the father was fine, loving, providing, caring. And the son went away out of his re rebellion and self-will and sin. But thankfully, he repented and came back. And that can happen too. God can restore family relationships. He did it with Joseph, you know, in the Old Testament. His brothers hated him so because of his dreams and because he was favored by his father and because he had the coat of many colors. They hated him. 
And so they sold him into slavery. And then they lied to the father. Told the father that he was killed by a wild animal. They couldn't find the body. But they had the blood all over his clothes. That proved it. So Jacob, the father, lived many years after that, probably about 13 to 15 years, thinking Joseph was dead or maybe even wondering what happened to him. He knew his other sons were rascals. He knew there was a possibility they were lying, and they were. But they let their father go through that torment for almost 15 years. And, uh, but then what happened? Finally, when they had to come to Joseph in Egypt in, in order to survive, and Joseph's dream was fulfilled, because it was from God, that they bowed down to Joseph and said, please sell us grain so we'll survive. And Joseph, second in command in Egypt, didn't let him know at first. He kind of taught him some lessons. Well, anyway, God used all that to bring the family of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, to bring him into Egypt. He used all that to uh, do his will. God changes evil into good, and he did it with Joseph and Joseph's life and what happened to him in big time. And Joseph even said it in, uh, in Genesis chapter 50. Let me read what Joseph said when the brothers all got back together. He forgave them. He forgave them, and he cried, and he, he had tears running down his eyes. And he hugged them, and he didn't punish them. He didn't get revenge on them. And this is what he said. What a man of faith. Let me read those words that Joseph said in uh, chapter 49. Uh, let's see. What I do? I lose the verse? I guess I did. Uh, let's see. Maybe it was chapter 48. I hate to... Well, anyway, I can't find the verse at this moment. But... Um, Let's see. Joseph made it a law over the land. And Joseph said, well, I'll paraphrase. Joseph said, God took the evil and changed it into good. And he did it for the family. He did it for the promises that God had made. God made promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob that he would make of them a great nation, which means they wouldn't be destroyed. And that's why God, Joseph was protected, even though he was sold into slavery. Even though later he was lied about and put in prison, and even later to that he was forgotten, even though a man who escaped from the prison uh, through the graces of Pharaoh forgot Joseph, God was involved in all of that to make things happen when God wanted them to happen. The evil turned into good, big time. The same thing is true in all of our lives. If only we had the patience to wait upon the Lord. If only we trusted in the Lord. That's what he wants. He wants people that have that kind of faith that can say, oh no, you meant it for evil. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He changed what you would have done into good. The leaders of the Jewish people, Pontius Pilate, the multitudes in Jerusalem, all conspired and resulted in Jesus dying on the cross. A horrible, horrible event from a human standpoint. An innocent person, uh, tormented, lied about, beaten, killed after being spit upon, mocked. And the most horrible death, the cross designed as a slow death of torture. And Jesus went to that to save us from our sins. Wow, I would say we owe him everything. We owe him everything. We should be able to willingly suffer whatever we must suffer in the life he's given us and to give him the glory and believe in him. If you know you're forgiven and you're going to heaven, you should be able to say what Joseph said. He meant it they meant it for evil, but God changed it into good. Anyway, a marriage for his son. 
he made a marriage for his son, a time of great celebration because it's the beginning of two people starting a life on this earth with great promise and great hope. It always starts with love. How does it end up? That's a big question. But anyway, concerning this marriage, Jesus is going to teach some very important lessons about this particular marriage, the parable of it. He said the kingdom of heaven's like this. You want to know what heaven's like? Think of a king. Who, the king's going to have a big feast. That's going to be a big marriage. He's got the means to do it. A big marriage celebration. And what's he do? He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. They wouldn't come. He sent forth his servants. The king has servants. Our king is Jesus. God is our king. And he sends us forth. Jesus said it. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How shall they believe except they hear? And how shall they hear except someone tell them the gospel? You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He that winneth souls is wise. All through the Bible, we see that God wants His believers to be His witnesses, to spread the gospel, to do something, pray, have a consistent Christian life. Speak. Tell others. Show a concern for their soul. And uh, that's what we're sent to do. And what happened when these servants, they went out and said, come to the wedding feast. Oh, that's symbolic. Come get right with God so you can go to heaven. Heaven's prepared for all the believers who are going to go there and live forever. It's wonderful. It's a great time of celebration. Come to it. You're invited to come. That's all it is, is an invitation. Come to, the, come to heaven. Come to Jesus so you can go to heaven. So it's an invitation. The invitation is given out and the first ones that's given to wouldn't come. Wouldn't come. But the, the king, he wants a lot of guests at his great feast. God wants everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. That's what God wants. He's a father. He wants a great family filled with children. He loves children. He wants you to be one of his children. And so he sends, sends us out with an invitation. That's all it is, is an invitation. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and we'll sup with him and he with me. And invitation. But, you know, it's just common sense. If someone gives you an invitation... You have the right to either accept it or reject it, right? And what's sad and what's crazy and what doesn't make any sense except the power of the devil and the selfishness of human nature and the deceitfulness of sin. You'd think everyone would take that invitation. I get to go to heaven for free, all my sins forgiven, and that's all I got to do is truly believe on Jesus. You'd think everyone would take, take God up on that, but no, because it's a choice everyone must make. And people are deciding to not accept the invitation. But again, the, the, the king wants more. Okay, those wouldn't accept the invitation, so now what's he going to do? He sent forth other servants, you and me, by the way, saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed. Innocent animals killed. What does that symbolize? Jesus, the Lamb of God, was killed for us. That's why it's prepared. And all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Come and be rightly related to God. Have a relationship with Jesus. True Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus. The invitation is come to Jesus. You can know him because he's alive. He rose from the dead, which means you can meet him through prayer and know him. What happens this time? The invitation went out again with more detail. Telling about how wonderful heaven it is. Reading the book of Revelation. All tears are wiped away. No more sickness. No more sorrow. No more death. Can go into great detail about the glory of God. The beauty of it. The streets paved with gold. Uh, no war there. Everything that everyone ever, ever wanted is in heaven. And you can preach some great sermons about heaven. The Bible has a lot to say about it. But they made light of it. They scoffed at it. 
didn't think it was important. And, wow, there's a lot of that, isn't there? Mockers. The mockers. They not only mocked Christ when he was on the cross, they'll mock you and me. They mock the gospel. They mock the Bible. And they do it often. They kicked it out of the classroom in America. They said, creation's not true. Evolution's true. And by the way, they even call it the theory of evolution. But then they teach it like it's a law. The reason it's called the theory of evolution, even to this day, it can't be proved. And the reason it can't be proved is not true. They made light of it and went their ways. Oh, their ways. They went their ways. You got to surrender and go Jesus' way. What was the first thing that the Apostle Paul said when he saw Jesus? He was on the road to Damascus. He was on his way to go get some more Christians and put them in jail. That was his way in the name of religion. And uh, what did he say to Jesus? Lord, what will you have me to do? Oh, he changed his way. That's repentance. You're going this way. Then you have a change of mind. You start going that way to Jesus to believe on him and start following him. But if you go your way, there is a way that seems right unto a man. But the end thereof is the way of death. They went their ways. One to his farm. Another to his merchandise. One was a farmer. The other was a shop owner. What's wrong with that? Nothing. It's good to have a farm. It's good to have a business that you take care of. And if you have a farm or a business, believe me, there's a lot of work. I saw a farm when I was a little kid. Two farms. Both sets of grandparents lived on farms. That's all they did from sun up to sundown. That's all they did was work. And even after sundown, then there was the cleaning the eggs and separating the milk and uh, doing all kinds of other stuff. If they had t time, they'd drag a tub of water into the kitchen and take a bath. Uh, but... Um, a lot of work. What was wrong? Priority. That's what was wrong with it. Working on your farm is a sin if it's more important to you than going God's way for your life. And that's what's going on today. People are busy. They're busy. One of the main reasons that people give me that they don't come to church, too busy. They work on Sunday. So they can't come. And they're so glad too. They've got that excuse, believe me. And the remnant took his servants, the ones that were left still, others out there, and treated them spitefully and slew them. All they did was bring the message of God's love, of Jesus dying for them, that they can go to heaven by the grace of God for free. The wonderful message about eternity. But the message is hated so much, they hate the messenger too. And that's where the persecution comes in. It can happen. And it's happening right now around the world in various places. And when the king heard thereof, oh, here, but here's what happens. What's the king going to do now? He's the king. He can do whatever he wants. He's king. Is he going to be real happy with those people that harmed his messengers? They harmed him. They hated him. What's he going to do? They threw away his invitation. No, it says the king was wroth. That means he's angry. God is holy. We're sinful. He's judge. He has to punish sin. Either through Christ to your benefit or through you to your loss. Jesus will either be your savior or your judge. It's going to happen. Jesus is making it very clear. He sent forth his armies. And destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And 37 years approximately after Jesus said these words, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman army. I was reading about it uh, today. There's quite a bit of historical knowledge about what happened when the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem and the surrounding area. And jo Josephus says that almost a million people were killed. They slaughtered. You've heard of Masada, that fortress that was real hard for the Romans to, because of where it was located and uh, how high, how well defended it was. They eventually got to it because they can always build these ramparts step by step, even if it takes years, step by step. I think it took them three years to get up to the top. 
And then when they went in there, most of the Jewish people had killed themselves in order to not be killed by the Romans. The Romans would have killed them. And they killed uh, a million, according to Josephus. They destroyed the temple. That's why there's no temple there today. They built a temple to a pagan god on the temple site. They burnt all the buildings of Jerusalem. They totally destroyed Jerusalem. And uh, I read what I read today, there was only one building. They left part of that building. Well, that was it. It was part of Herod's palace. They left part of it. That's all they, they left. And um, what Jesus said came to pass. He was warning them that if they reject him, the people of Jerusalem, this is what would happen to them. And it happened. And right now there's a warning in the Bible. The judgment's coming. The judgment is coming. And if you want to read about it, millions, oh no, not millions, billions will be killed in the Great Tribulation. Billions. And then when Jesus comes back, he will totally annihilate the armies of the Antichrist. It will be probably a multi-million man army. And they'll die instantly from Christ. Because he won't come as a gentle lamb the second time. He will come as a mighty warrior with vengeance and with wrath and with judgment. He's warning it. That's the reality of life. And God does it. I mean, where do you think death comes from? It's a terrible thing, death. It came from God. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve. They were going to live in the Garden of Eden forever. But because they sinned, death came into the world. God warned them. He said, the moment you eat of the forbidden fruit, you shall surely die. And they did die spiritually. They became separated from God. And then they died physically. And we die physically. And the, every human being now dies. We know of two that didn't die in the Bible. Every other one just died. Death and his judgment from God. It's terrible. Death is terrible. Thankfully, we have eternal life to replace it with. If you believe in Jesus, we get restored to paradise through Christ. Burned up their city, and Jerusalem was burned up and burnt to the ground, except for part of one building, according to what I read. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. They weren't worthy. What makes them worthy? Accept the invitation, that's all. Be willing to go God's way instead of your own way. And they couldn't find anyone. Up to that point, they couldn't find anyone willing to accept the invitation and to say, I'll go your way, Lord. Remember, it's what it says, the plan of salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe at the moment of salvation, at least, the flesh crops up real quickly after that. But at the moment of salvation, a person that's truly saved calls Jesus Lord. And they're ready, ready to do what he says. They better grow in the Lord quick or they're going to fall away quickly. But at the time of salvation, they're surrendered to go his way. Well, these people weren't. And then there's verse 9. I'm going to end with this verse. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. Go everywhere you can. Go into the streets. Go where people are. Whoever you find, invite them. Because what does God want? He wants everyone to be saved. And what's his method of doing it? Taking the Christians and having them be his mouthpiece and telling people about Jesus. And uh, we need to do that. We need to do that in France. We need to do that here. And that's why I try to hand out a lot of tracts here because I don't want to be a hypocrite. Go to France, hand out a bunch of tracts and not hand them out here and not try to reach people here. The Lord wants everyone to be saved. Everyone in this community, everyone in every country. Who's going to do it? Not many people ready to do this. Go out into the highways and invite them to come to. Who's going to do it? A little bit. But like Paul. Wow. Read, first, uh, read 2 Corinthians. I think it's chapter 11. Where he tells about what he suffered in trying to obey that command. He suffered shipwrecks 
beatings, imprisonments, stonings, as well as many other things. And you can read about them. And I'm thinking, wow, would I get a few frowns and I'm ready to get discouraged? A few insults? That's nothing compared to what other Christians have gone through to obey what the Father wants. He wants us to give the invitations out. That's all. Give out the invitations. It's their decision. But somebody's got to give out the invitations. You and me. That's all, that's all he's got. he got you and me and the other Christians. That's his way of doing it. That's what he's telling us. This is God's way of evangelizing the world. He wants everyone to be saved, but he wants you and me to give out the invitations. And if we've got to go out in the streets to do it, to do it. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your teaching to us. Help us to remember it, to put it in our hearts and to know how to put it into effect. We're so weak and so unfaithful. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to do better. Help us to care about the lost souls of the world. Help us to care about Democrats and Republicans and independents. Help us to care about those that have uh, lifestyles totally different from what we aspire to, but to care about them and care about their souls. Help us deliver the gospel, Lord. We pray this to you. That's our request. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.